Good morning, everyone. My name is Cassie Hopkins, and I coordinate the webinars for Hausman Johnson Insurance. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Risk to Insure or Not to Insure, by Diana Schmidt. Today's webinar will run the full hour. If there is time after the webinar, we will have a question and answer session. If you have a question during the webinar, feel free to type it into the question feature and I will address it. After the webinar is over, there will be a short survey we are hoping you can fill out for us. Also, please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and will be available for review on the webinar archives of our website. If you do not want to participate in a recorded webinar, you may want to close the application at this time. You will receive a follow-up email from GoToWebinar with a link to the recording and the presentation slides. I would now like to introduce you to our presenter for today's webinar, Diana Schmidt. Diana joined the Hausman Johnson Insurance team in 2017 with over 15 years of property and casualty underwriting and claim experience. She spent the last 10 years as a multi-line underwriting officer at Travelers Insurance, where she created guaranteed cost and loss-sensitive casualty programs for large manufacturing and technology accounts. In this role, Diana excelled at building trusting relationships, designing robust coverage programs, and collaborating with risk control and claim partners to offer strong service platforms, which helped clients control the total cost of their risk. Diana thrives on being a true advocate and problem solver for her clients, balancing her underwriter expertise and service-focused approach with the best-in-class service offerings of Hausman Johnson Insurance and the Benefit Service Group. She brings tremendous value to her clients. We are extremely grateful Di can be with us today to share her knowledge on this topic. Welcome, Diana. Thank you, Cassie. Good morning. Thank you for uh, attending the webinar this morning. As Cassie indicated, my name is Diana Schmidt, and I'm a property and casualty consultant at Houseman Johnson Insurance. I specialize in all things insurance because I'm passionate about learning, and I always strive to be a trusted advisor to my clients, colleagues, and friends. If I can take the weight of the insurance world off their shoulders, even for a few minutes, they will be able to focus and excel at what they do best, and that's my goal. As Kathy indicated, I've been in the insurance industry for over 16 years. The majority of this time I spent on the carrier side specializing in underwriting large guarantee cost and loss sensitive programs. Understanding the concepts of these loss sensitive programs is a specialty, and I was fortunate to have some, of, um, some amazing and talented mentors from both Wausau Insurance and Travelers who had significant experience with these types of programs. I've supplemented this priceless hands-on experience with years of insurance education. I'm always looking um, for other insurance specialists to connect with, uh, so if you're interested in connecting, please reach out. Today, we're gonna explore the key concepts of insurance risk, try to understand the intricacies of both guarantee costs and loss sensitive programs, and gain a deeper understanding of how to assess your company's risk. I created the content of this webinar um, in response to several questions that I received uh, frequently when I was an underwriter. I was often asked, guarantee costs or loss sensitive? How do I know which program is best? And what are the risks of moving from a guarantee cost program to a loss sensitive program? So these are the types of questions that we will uh, try to answer for you today. Um, so what is risk? The International Risk Management Institute, or ERMI, as I will refer to it throughout the webinar, suggests that risk can be both a verb or a noun, depending on the context in which it is used. As a verb or an action word, to take risk means to take a chance. This would indicate that risk has to do with uncertainty in an outcome. As a noun, risk is something that can be quantified. You could ask. What is the risk of our building burning down? You could actually look at a loss and determine the value of it. It would be looking at the limits of insurance on a property policy and calculating what, uh, what type of loss is likely to occur. And then trying to figure out what can I do to control it? 
or what can I do to mitigate it? If you can quantify risk, you can implement measures to manage it. This is commonly known as risk management. The risk management um, process is, is defined as the process of identifying, assessing, and controlling loss exposure. You use physical and human resources to minimize the impact of loss through methods of risk reduction, so think loss control, risk financing, think guarantee cost or loss sensitive programs, or risk avoidance. Some risks are so great that you're just going to decide you're not willing to take it and you're not willing to pay for it, so you're going to avoid it. The goal of risk management is to ultimately reduce the long-term overall cost of risk for your organization without interfering with its goals and normal activities. Yeah. Today's webinar will focus on the risk financing piece of the risk management process. We'll explore advantages and disadvantages of various, various risk financing methods in an effort to control your organization's total cost of risk. As we start reviewing the different financing methods, let's first understand the definition of the cost of risk. The total cost of risk should be inclusive of all costs associated with risk, both your direct costs, which are really easy to quantify, and your indirect costs, which are going to be a little bit tougher to quantify. Direct costs will include insurance premiums, broker fees or commissions, and other items um, associated with your risk management um, processes. Think about your safety budget or the cost to administer your safety program. Uh, you may have service contracts that cost you uh, money to, to, get that, to get that service. If you're purchasing a loss sensitive program, you're going to have additional direct costs relating to the risk that you retain, the losses that you have to pay on behalf of um, having either a retention or a deductible. We'll talk more about these costs later. Indirect costs include costs associated with things like uh, reduced productivity um, as you have an injured worker out, as a manager completes a, a claim investigation. Um, maybe they're spending additional time um, hiring and retraining an employee to take the injured worker's place until he can return back to full duty. Um, indirect costs are tough to quantify. You can generally estimate uh, the indirect cost as a multiple of your direct costs. Typically, for each $1 claim, you can assume at least $1.50 up to $5 for indirect costs. We can now see why having a solid risk management program impact, can impact your total cost of risk. Keep this in mind as we explore the various financing methods. All right, so here we go. The insurance dollar, one of the largest direct costs associated with, um, with risk is your insurance premium. For guaranteed costs, the direct cost is the insurance premium itself. If you are on a less sensitive program, you're going to have premium, and you're also going to have actual losses retained under the deductible or the loss limit that would be considered your direct cost. Having a basic understanding of the components of what goes into the creation or development of an insurance premium is important for comparing the different risk financing methods. It's also important to show you which pieces you can focus on controlling to ultimately reduce your total cost of risk. All right, so take a look at that, uh, that hypothetical claim dollar we just saw. We're going to break it down so you can understand what, um, how and what a premium um, is created. Insurance premium can be divided into two basic parts. The first part is expenses. For every $1 of insurance premium collected, 40% or 40 cents on the dollar typically consists of expenses. The largest expense a carrier typically has is acquisition costs. These are expenses associated with producing new policies, 
such as staffing a field office and paying agent commissions. Unallocated claim expenses are um, for, related to the cost of having a claim center operation. Other expenses can be related to having loss control um, surveys, administrating and auditing policies, uh, profit, and tax. Taxes such as um, state licenses, fees, um, premiums, and miscellaneous taxes all um, come into play when contemplating um, the total premium. If expenses make up 40%, the remaining 60% um, is typically um, related to expected losses. That's a big number. So as you can see, there's a, there's a really big incentive for you to take a look at expected losses and try to find a way to control them. The actual um, cost and percentages of, the, uh, of our hypothetical premium dollar here can vary from carrier to carrier. Some carriers will try to, to mitigate their expenses, the costs that they have um, in providing their services to you um, in an effort to be more profitable and competitive. You are also incentivized to control the claims, to try to control your total cost. The key to this understanding is, is simply that controlling losses is the largest, uh, provides the largest potential opportunity for you to mitigate and control your total cost of risk. We're going to start looking, um, looking at some risk financing options. We're going to explore um, traditional risk transfer and alternative risk transfer. We'll take a look first at traditional risk transfer. When an organization does not want to retain any risk whatsoever, they would typically purchase a guaranteed cost policy from an insurance carrier. This is the most common um, financing method. In return for a negotiated premium, the insurance carrier will assume 100% of the risk and pays 100% of the claims during the policy period. Guaranteed cost programs are offered for all lines of coverage and to all sizes of, um, of organizations. This can be a workers' comp, auto, general liability, or property policy. The ERMI definition of guaranteed cost, premium that is determined prospectively, blocking in the cost for the policy period, regardless of the loss experience. A prospective rating plan means that the premium is calculated um, at the onset of the policy term based on past loss experience and will not fluctuate with the actual loss experience uh, during the policy period. There's also um, an experience modification component to, um, to premium. Um, this um, modification is typically calculated from an insurance bureau, such as the um, NCCI or the Independent Wisconsin Bureau. What the bureaus do is they gather exposure and loss information on every um, person and on every insurance policy. Um, they calculate their experience relative to their peer group. The goal is to reduce the um, subsidization of work comp premiums so employers with higher work comp injuries pay a greater share of insurance costs, while those with fewer injuries will typically pay a reduced cost. Experience modifications will look at the most recently completed three-year term uh, as they gather this data to calculate the experience modification for the current term. Since it takes three years into account for every policy term, it really incentivizes even guaranteed cost buyers to control their, their total cost of risk um, by implementing loss control strategies to, to really control their claims. Um, experience modification factors are mandatory in all states, but they're not, um, they're not, not all companies will qualify. 
So there is a premium threshold, and the smaller accounts uh, typically will not have uh, this factor applied to their premium. The premium for guaranteed cost is based on a set rate um, applied per 100 of estimated exposures, which is usually payroll. Once the policy term ends, the policies are audited and the actual exposures are used to finalize the premium calculation. The key thing to remember on guaranteed cost is that the, um, the ultimate premium is not adjusted for your current term losses. So you can be confident um, that the premium um, at the onset of the term will loosely <laughs> reflect the premium um, after the policy has expired, um, adjusted for actual exposures. Some advantages of guaranteed cost policies. As I mentioned, it's the most commonly um, common rating plan used uh, across the whole industry. That means that almost all carriers offer guaranteed cost policies. So what that means for you is that you have um, a wide selection of carriers to pick from when you're looking for a carrier partner. The premiums are set at the beginning of the policy and will not adjust with the actual loss experience of the period. This will provide financial stability of knowing your insurance costs and being able to budget accordingly. There are a few techniques available that can reduce the cost of a guaranteed cost program. One um, example of this is a dividend. The dividend can be a flat percentage of the premium or a sliding scale dividend tied to the loss experience of the policy. Dividends are used in states like Wisconsin where the state sets the insurance rates and the carriers have, have no rating flexibility when establishing premiums. Some disadvantages. Uh, the premium you're going to see on a guaranteed cost policy will typically be higher than the premiums for other risk financing options. Uh, since there's no chance to um, share in the profits, uh, there's no incentive potentially for you to control risk, or at least that's the theory. Um, a good loss year will not uh, benefit you, at least in the current term. The phrase in the industry to represent this is that buyers of guaranteed cost policies have no skin in the game. That just means that if you're having a bad loss year, there may be no additional incentive for you to try to mitigate and control um, future losses. Sometimes um, the size of the premium um, doesn't make sense uh, for guarantee costs. Um, the larger you are as an organization and the higher your workers' compensation premium um, gets, uh, you may be incentivized to look at al alternative um, methods uh, such as loss sensitive programs. I had several loss sensitive accounts um, as an underwriter who would have been leaving a lot of premium on the table if they continued with the guarantee cost program when compared to um, a loss sensitive program. Alternative risk transfer as a risk financing method. Um, loss sensitive plans are a form of risk financing where the organization retains a portion of the risk to reduce insurance costs. Some examples are large deductibles or retrospective rating programs. Loss sensitive plans allow an organization to retain risk, which will therefore reduce insurance costs. Typically, the insurance costs are below what they would pay on a guaranteed cost basis. It uses um, current term losses to calculate the ultimate cost of insurance and typically will be subject to a minimum and a maximum cost. These types of plans provide cash flow benefits. They also provide the opportunity to reduce insurance costs if you can control the losses that are occurring in the current period. Loss sensitive programs are available for most casualty lines of coverage, workers' compensation, general liability, and auto. The most typical line that you'll find in a loss sensitive program is the workers' compensation line. You can also, um, you'll also see two or three lines 
retro programs, which would mean that there's either um, one, two, or three lines uh, combined into the program for lost sensitive rating, the workers' comp, the liability, and the auto. In my lost sensitive and captive studies, I frequently hear the phrase, the first dollar of insurance you buy is the most expensive. A loss sensitive plan, such as a high deductible or a retrospective plan, are considered alternative risk financing plans because it allows the insured to assume a finite amount of risk in exchange for a reduction in premium. This will improve cash flow because you're not paying in um, a high premium like the guaranteed cost would have. There are many types of alternative risk financing programs. Today, we'll take a look at two, the, retro, the deductible program and the retention program. In the retrospective rating program, the premium is calculated based off the standard premium and an estimate of expected losses. The organization's current loss experience during the term will be used to determine the ultimate cost of the plan. If the loss experience is favorable, it can generate a premium credit at the first retro premium adjustment. This typically occurs six months after the policy expiration date. Subsequent retro premium adjustments occur annually until all claims are closed or a settlement is agreed upon. This can take up to three to five years or even longer. If the actual loss experience is favorable during the rating period, it can earn a premium credit at that first retro adjustment. However, if your experience is worse than expected, you've had a bad claim year, you had a severity-driven loss or higher frequency than you typically um, have, the retro premium adjustment can result in an additional premium charge. What you're looking at here is um, a basic retrospective rating formula. The retrospective premium formula consists of basic premium plus converted losses times the tax multiplier. The, the premium is subject to a minimum premium as well as a maximum premium, typically. Um, for the purposes of this webinar, we'll take a high look at these various components. If you're interested in additional information, we can schedule a separate meeting to discuss. Essentially, the, the premium formula, um, if you take a look at the basic premium, this is relieve the carrier's expenses for handling your policy. Um, the converted losses are simply the, the loss component and adjusted for expenses. These two items, the basic premium and the converted losses are multiplied by the tax multiplier. The tax multiplier is typically a fee for all of the um, taxes um, and surcharges that the state uh, will require. The retro premium um, is subject to the max, as I indicated, which places a cap on the ultimate cost of the plan if you were to have a poor loss year. The minimum premium places a limit on the potential savings in a good loss year. There are a few optional retrospective rating factors that you can consider. The first is the retro development factor. As I mentioned earlier, the retrospective um, adjustments can, can continue uh, indefinitely, um, at least three to five years, if not up to 10. If you want to limit um, your risk to something, uh, let's say for example, three or five years, you can purchase um, a, a program with a retro development factor. This will specify if the plan will close out um, at the particular year chosen. So if you choose a five-year development factor, there will be a premium adjustment um, each year um, until the plan closes. So um, the retro adjustment really is additional premium for the carrier for taking the risk that when that five-year hits and they close this plan, that the claims 
uh, that are running through the retrospective rating formula will still be open or developing. So they're taking risk that they're going to continue to pay claims long after um, this policy is closed out for you. There can also be a factor added if you want to have a loss limit per claim, which would also increase the overall premium. The loss limit would typically start at $100,000 and could go up to $500,000. The, um, the cost associated with this um, is based off of your total premium size as well as the loss limit selected. If you choose to take additional risk um, or have a higher loss limit, um, the greater uh, the premium um, credit will be. These terms are all negotiated prior to the start of the policy period and are typically outlined in a written agreement provided by the carrier. Here we're going to take a look at a couple types of different retro programs. So the unlimited retrospective program. Um, this is a retro program that does not have a maximum premium cap. It offers still the minimum premium, so you, you can control your losses. You uh, can get a discount on your total cost of risk. However, if you don't control your losses, the program is essentially unlimited. All of the losses that you experience will flow through the program. There's no maximum cap to protect you from a bad loss day. I would not recommend this type of program. However, it might be the only option available to you, uh, which is something that we should talk about. The paid loss retro. These plans are typically um, expensive, and they're not as common as incurred loss retros. They do offer deferred pay in premium. They use um, paid losses for, instead of incurred losses in the premium calculation, and the losses are tax deductible when paid. There's typically a loss fund or escrow established to pay losses and invoices uh, be insured monthly. Typically, the escrow is two to three months worth of paid losses. The incurred loss retro is a type of plan that is generally less expensive um, and more common than the other plans we previously discussed. This plan uses incurred losses um, in the premium calculation. The incurred loss retro has similar features to the other two plans mentioned. You can purchase um, a loss limit as well as a max um, to protect your ultimate bad day. So now we'll take a look at the advantages of retro rating. Um, these programs allow you typically to pay in a lower premium, which uh, creates instant cash flow. This is obviously in exchange for taking risk on the program. Um, increased risk usually results in a, your um, focus on controlling losses. You will have skin in the game and take more ownership of the risk because of your investment um, in the loss limit um, of the program. There's a lot of flexibility in plan design. As we mentioned, there's a lot of different features that you can contemplate the risk versus the reward of having. If there's not a lot of cash incentive to have a maximum on the policy and you're pretty confident that your losses are stable and you can predict um, what your loss year will look like, you might decide to not purchase a maximum um, aggregate on the policy. Features such as the loss limit and the maximum um, can be added, which will ultimately reduce your total um, cost of risk. Or it'll increase, if they added, it, it'll increase your cost of risk, but it'll reduce uncertainty is what I meant to say. Um, you can also uh, limit uncertainty by uh, buying a closeout option. Um, if you don't want these policies to remain open for five to 10 years, uh, then I would suggest taking a close look um, at the three to five year um, retro development factors. Um, <clears throat> these uh, programs 
do create positive cash flow, which is one of the advantages of the program. Some of the um, disadvantages of retrospective rating. Um, poor loss experience can direct in higher premiums. Plan design can also negatively impact the total cost of risk, as we've mentioned previously. A non-limited program or um, a really high loss limit um, could put you in an adverse um, situation that you can't financially sustain. Um, you need to start to fund for your retention losses. How are you going to pay for these claims once they occur? Collateral may be required, which will add um, to the total cost of risk. It will also tie up your collateral um, that you may want to use down the road for some other, um, some other um, opportunity. Uh, the loss fund is required, so you have to have cash on hand for a few years of losses um, to get the program started. And as mentioned before, the retro adjustments could continue um, indefinitely um, or at least five to ten years. We're going to take a look now at a deductible program. Deductibles are a form of self-insurance where the employer is responsible for reimbursing the insurer for claims up to a certain dollar amount. The insurer is then responsible for paying any claim in excess of that amount. Deductibles are typically between $100,000 and $500,000 and can be offered on a per claim or per occurrence basis. Um, the deductible credit will vary depending on the amount of risk retained. So the higher the deductible, the, um, the lower the premium will be. There's, this method um, of rating avoids the application of premium taxes and other assessments with respect to the deductible layer. If you are paying those claims under the deductible layer, you're not going to have to pay premium tax on them. Similar to the other programs we discussed, if you want to limit um, your catastrophic exposure, you can buy an aggregate deductible. Um, this will um, work similar to the maximum premium in a retrospective program. Typically, these programs will also require loss funds and collateral. Some of the um, the benefits of a deductible program um, include that you still have access to insurer provided services. This, this um, benefit is actually um, in comparison to if you chose self-insurance um, or a captive option. So the bigger the, the organization, um, the, the bigger focus is going to be on the services provided and who's providing them. Um, if you want to choose to use a third-party administrator for services, that is typically an option um, on the deductible program. There's a significant opportunity to reduce costs. Trading risk for deductible credits can have a major impact on the um, fixed cost of insurance. It also um, provides a, a huge incentive to implement risk management programs um, and control your losses. The losses um, in the current term are used to calculate the, the final cost of the premium. So usually this causes, <laughs> causes people to take a, take a hard look at what they're doing in the current um, moment to help control those losses. Um, the aggregate deductible um, can limit risk um, if you have a catastrophic loss occur. Um, it could add some extra protection for you. Um, as, as mentioned, uh, it allows for control over insurance costs due to control of your losses, um, and you retain the use of cash until a loss is actually to be paid, which is a cash flow advantage. Some, uh, some reasons why a deductible might not be a good option um, well, they're not available in all states. So if you're in a state like Wisconsin, um, they do not allow the use of deductible programs. So you would be um, looking at 
retrospective rating options uh, or guarantee cost policies. As of now, there's about 45 states that do allow for deductibles. So typically, um, you would use the deductible in lieu of a retrospective plan if it was actually available. Um, the insurer is going to continue to control the entire claim process um, unless you choose to use a third-party administrator. Uh, there's increased uncertainty and difficulty uh, if you're an organization that needs to budget um, and the cost of collateral and loss fund uh, will increase the cost um, of your risk and tie up collateral that could be used for um, your organization's other opportunities. Um, again, you need to fund for your deductible losses so that you have money available um, to pay the losses when they are paid. This chart is really just a summary of what we've talked about so far. Um, I actually got it from one of my captive insurance classes that I took earlier this summer. Um, it kind of talks through um, the traditional insurance program, which would be the guaranteed cost, um, and the alternative risk programs, which would be loss sensitive options, such as the high deductible and the retrospective rating. Um, this is a summary of what we went through already, so I won't go through it again. I just thought it would be nice to um, give this to you in chart form so that you can have a quick uh, snapshot of what was talked about today. So now, is loss sensitive right for you? There are many reasons why organizations contemplate or choose loss-sensitive plans over traditional guarantee cost financing. Some view themselves as best-in-class risk, which um, with the loss results to prove it. They want to earn the opportunity to have a reduced premium because they can control their losses. Other reasons, uh, other organizations have other reasons for choosing loss-sensitive. They may have a dissatisfaction with the um, cyclical nature of the commercial insurance industry, um, which is often a primary motivation for insurers to either increase their retention levels or seek um, alternative financial solutions that do not involve traditional methods of financing like guarantee cost policies. Um, you could be in a situation where your carrier is changing um, their terms and conditions. They might be offering a non-renewal, um, raising retentions, uh, or just simply pulling out a market. If this is your situation, um, taking a look at a loss of the plan might be um, warranted. One of the main things, though, that we should think about if you're contemplating loss sensitive is, um, are you willing to take risk, uh, first and foremost? And if you are willing to take risk, um, what, uh, what financial um, stability do you have to actually um, sustain that view for a long term? Um, as we discussed, these plans can stay open for five to 10 years. Um, so you have to make sure that you can actually pay losses um, that occur year over year over year uh, without um, putting your company at risk. Um, if we move on to the next slide here, um, we're taking a look at the insurance industry market conditions. Uh, the, the United States property and casualty insurance industry has been in a soft market since at least 2007, that has continued uh, through 2017. Stock markets are generally characterized by lower premium rates, broader coverage, um, reduced underwriting standards, and increased competition. However, following the 2017 catastrophe events and continued underperformance in the auto market, many insurers are taking steps to improve underwriting performance, primarily through premium rate increases um, albeit moderate, moderate increases. Um, capacity does not appear to be an issue in um, the current 2017 year results here. Um, and 
is not uh, projected to be an issue in 2018 or 19. If we take a look specifically at the workers' compensation line, um, you can see from the combined ratio history here that the current 2017 combined ratio of 92.2% um, is a significant improvement um, over what the, the market and industry was experiencing back um, in you know, 2008 through 2012. Um, this would, would suggest that the workers' comp line is getting healthier, that carriers are um, potentially making a profit, um, and that rate is potentially not needed. If we take a look at average commercial premium rates um, across the various lines of business um, from 2015 through 2017, there are a few key things that I'll point out. Prior to quarter four of 2017, rates were declining on all lines except commercial auto. In uh, the fourth quarter, there were slight rate increases on all lines except for workers' comp, which actually had a 2% rate decrease. Wisconsin workers' comp in particular has experienced um, three consecutive years of workers' compensation rate decreases. Um, the Bureau sets the rates in Wisconsin and has felt that year over year uh, the rate decreases were justifiable. Um, so given all of this data, it does not appear that the market is changing um, per se. So if this is a, is a concern um, that may or may not push you to consider moving from a guaranteed cost program to a loss sensitive, um, you know, it's something to keep an eye on but probably not going to be your motivating factor. Uh, your motivating factor might just simply be something like, I'm a best in class risk, and I want a, the opportunity to save money on my cost, uh, cost of insurance. Um, before we get to questions, I just thought I would talk briefly about a few next steps. Um, if you are interested in learning more, um, or if you want to talk specifically about your organization's risk and the impact of potentially moving from a guaranteed cost to a lot sensitive program. Uh, let's set up the time to meet. Um, what I would love to do is do a five-year look back at your loss experience and your risk control, um, your controls um, and exposures, and we can kind of set up um, what it would have looked like if you were um, in a loss sensitive program. We can do a few things like a break-even analysis um, and review, uh, review all of your loss controls to really make sure if you're not in the best place to make that change today, how can we get you in the best possible position to move forward and have that, op that um, opportunity to move to a loss sensitive program in the future. Uh, so with that, um, that's, uh, that's what I have for you today. Thank you, Di. Thank you for attending today's webinar. As a reminder, please fill out the short survey sent to you as your feedback is very important to us. Please join us next time for our webinar, Launching into Leadership, The Four Traits of an Inspired Leader by Suzanne Templin on November 15th. You can sign up for this webinar on the Hausman Johnson website. Thank you for attending and have a great rest of your morning.